In this video, you'll see a conversation between myself and Ryan Canestro, who you might know from the Home Recording Show podcast that I host with him. And he's finally switching from Pro Tools to Reaper, and uh, I'm gonna take the next hour to answer his questions. If any of you guys need help like this, one-on-one -on -one with me, I charge $40 an hour for a Skype call, and we can do remote control and things like that uh, to solve all those little problems that you have. Now, with that out of the way, let's get into the video, and I hope you enjoy it. Hey, Ryan. Hi. So, you got lots of Reaper questions, I guess. I do. Uh, I, I finally am going to get rid of uh, Pro Tools. I've made the decision because, uh, because of everything. And uh, I noticed today when I pulled up my copy of Reaper and then updated it, the still evaluating thing came up and said I was on day 1001. <laughs> You know, it does take a while to decide. Well, I'd only opened it 15 times in 1,001 days. <laughs> yeah. I was using it quite a bit, and it was up to about 300 days when I bought my license. So, And then I got five years out of it. Yeah. So I bought it today. It's on. It's happening. Sweet. And I've gotten pretty far. Like, uh, if you look at my screen, I've already got tracks in from, uh, just exported a bunch of stuff from Pro Tools, two MIDI tracks, got those in. Got the virtual instruments up, so I've got the uh, Stephen Slate playing the the drum track. Click on that. Uh oh, beach ball already. Okay, hasn't crashed yet. I've got a lot of stuff going on, on the computer right now. Yeah. So I uh, got the Stephen Slate going, and then uh, also uh, I had a B three on one of the tracks, so I don't exactly have a B three on this. So I used uh, just whatever was in the Apple plugins, and then a little Leslie program on top of that. Mm -hmm. And then just spread it out with a imager to try to pretend like it was still good. Yeah. And it's not. Okay. So what you're seeing there, that extra window, mm -hmm. that's um, the bridge or 32-bit uh, plugins in a 64-bit okay. session or 64-bit uh, Reaper. Yeah, this guy right here. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, so the actual plugin window is in a separate process. Just a facade. The actual interface is kind of separate from Reaper. Uh, gotcha. Because it's bridged. So you can either update uh, your plugins to see if there's a 64-bit version, or you could roll back to the 32-bit version of Reaper. Up to you. Um, I've kind of gotten rid of most of the plugins that uh, are 32-bit only, and I keep everything 64-bit. Gotcha. Yeah, I was wondering why those kept popping up. Yeah, it looks like the Waves versions that you have are 32-bit only. Yeah, and let's yeah. see, what's the... Uh... I think the Valhalla, yep, that one too. Okay, so that one definitely has an update. You're just okay. behind a bit on that one. So now I know where, where I need to go with all that stuff. Yep. Update plugins. I better get more paper. <laughs> all right, and I see something else here. It says uh, offline on all those audio, tra uh, awesome. all the audio tracks. Because I clicked on something else. Yeah. So if you open up preferences, which mm -hmm. is the... Uh, um, Command comma, and then let's see. It's uh, it, you see on the bottom left, there's that find mm -hmm. option. Just type in offline. Yeah, that one there. Set media items offline when the application is not active. Uncheck mm -hmm. that. Uh, that one. Yeah. And hit apply, and that's good. So, so that's going to keep your audio items. Um, always active. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, there's another super noob question. When I'm doing something else and I want to hit the space bar for playback, the the screen's not selected over here. So I would like to be able to be dialing in plug-in settings and still stop and start. Is there a way to do that? Hmm. Is your mixer docked or is it just two floating windows? I think it's two floating windows. Yeah. Okay. So, so you go to the... I guess you can't see my mouse on your screen, but nope. okay. So I have no idea what you're doing. Uh, on the right side of the mixer, there's a looks. There's a little icon with some looks like some faders, like bottom right of the mixer. Bottom of that. Yeah, that thing. Right click that, right. and then click on and choose dock mixer in Docker. Okay. All right. So that's going to snap it to the bottom of the main window uh -huh. 
So it puts so it all you, in one window. If you maximize that main window, this bottom section, the Docker area, can be resized however you want. But there's also mm -hmm. multiple Dockers. So right now, this like the main Docker, it's usually uh, at the bottom. If you click and drag um, the tab for the for that, yeah, right there. Mm -hmm. Click that, drag it over to the edge of the screen, over to the right side of the window. Over here. Uh, yeah, you should see there's that gray line there. And now it's now the mixer is docked over there. You can drag that bar over again, and. Uh, oh, I think I broke it. <laughs> drag the edge between the arrange view and the mixer over. There and, we go. Okay, yeah. now it's all part of one setup. Yeah. Nice. Okay. So now I won't I won't deselect because of the window. Right. And gotcha. now if you if you hit uh, I believe it's option D to uh, hide the dock. Yeah. So that. Oh. So. There's two views for you. Yeah, so this is pretty much how I like my my setup to look. This is how mm -hmm. I had everything in Pro Tools. I used to have two 19-inch monitors, and the edit on the left, the mix on the right, it just seems like the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. You may have also been running into the problem where you had a uh, bridged 32-bit plugin open, and Pro that, takes, that takes uh, control of the keyboard. It probably and that's probably what was happening because okay. uh, that sounds pretty familiar. But I, I do like this better. I, okay. I, I like this all, all, all smashed together. Yeah, I'm into it. And I do something similar. I I keep my uh, the the dock at the bottom for the mixer, and I use three different screen sets. So my keyboard shortcut alphanumeric one is uh, just the range view. Two is is a full screen mixer or nearly full screen mixer. And then three is about 50-50 of each. And that's just pushing the numbers that'll change your views? With my setup, I, that's how I have it. So you custom set that? Yeah. Uh, yeah I've noticed there's a lot of custom settings in the software. There, There is a ton. <laughs> and with the uh, SWS extensions and with uh, scripting, there's it's really almost infinite what you can do with it. If you can think of a workflow, you can probably find a way to do it. With shading so, actions. Something I was I was thinking about. So I noticed um, for all these little guys over here, I can drag these up. I could drag these down to give me different spacing for however many plugins or sends I want. Mm -hmm. I, I noticed there was something I did, and I I don't know how I did it, uh, but I was able to get the the plugin settings in here somewhere too, like individual plugin settings. I'm, I'm sure you know what I'm talking yeah, about. Yeah, yeah. I'm just still talking. Remember the icon on the master fader. Mm -hmm. um, there's some more options in there. Show effects parameters when size permits. Yeah. All right. So you add those those controls in um, individually on the plugin. So like right click each plugin. So like just click on any of the of the effects. So on the window on the the floating window on the left. Not not that one. The other one. This guy. Yeah. Because this is a bridge plugin, so there's mm -hmm. that parameters button. That guy. Yeah. And then there's effects parameter list and oh. uh, show and track controls, and it'll also uh, that list will change based on like if you just grab the attack control or something, mm -hmm. um, it will show up in that list as the last touch parameter. You can also set up a keyboard shortcut. So like if you just move one control and then you hit your keyboard shortcut, it's got, it'll add it to the track or you can add an envelope to the track, that sort of thing. That's pretty cool. Now envelope, how do I get rid of them? <laughs> uh, you uh, just uncheck it from that. Uh, from that parameter? Y yeah. So wherever that original thing is probably, it's probably in that one. I'm not sure which. Uh... Yeah. So uncheck those. I'm not sure if there's a quick way. It's probably something in the. Uh, well, yeah, if like you just uncheck delete all, delete the plugin might be the fastest way. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that would be delete, delete effects. There we go. Yeah. The other quick way of doing it is to alt click on something. Oh yeah, yeah, I saw that. I was I was watching a bunch of your videos earlier. Yeah, there's I've got one that's like five tips in the Reaper mixer. It was just like little workflow things. 
So it looks like I have at least one plugin here that's 64-bit. Uh, yep. And this is one of my favorite little plugins. I, I, I couldn't be without it. As soon as uh, I looked through my list and it wasn't there, uh, after I stopped sobbing uncontrollably, I went and found it, put it back in. Yeah, I've, I've stopped using it for a while because I didn't want to sign up for Plugin Alliance. But I, I think I might just because Clean Sweep really is such an easy-to-use plugin. It saves so much time just setting up your tracks. Oh, yeah. Oh, you've just found the thing. I did. I think I, think I did. <laughs> Right-click the, the effects parameter. It is something that I don't use very often, um, but I have uh, made up a track template that is like re-EQ, re-comp, and then I kind of have a um, channel strip set up. Mm -hmm. So there's like the high-pass filter and the, the threshold control and stuff like that on the uh, on the track so it's really easy to you know do your basic settings without having to open up the plugin but then after i set it up i never actually used it in the mix <laughs> yeah so uh, the theory is nice if i have everything set up like right here i can kind of see if i ever wanted if i ever need to throw something in there i could mm -hmm. but it, it i mean it's so easy to just click on the thing and then you can mess with it it's not it's not like <laughs> yeah. it's that hard to get to at all yeah but yeah, when you have to cancel out of it and you have to kill two windows though that are on different sides of the universe, that kind of sucks. So yeah. I'll put that in my list of things here. Update. Um, there's also the escape key should close any floating window okay. that's uh, selected. All right. So um, we went through a bunch of stuff earlier. Um, the big thing that I'm missing from Pro Tools is the virtual instruments. So I'm going to have to yeah. find some. Yeah. And VST and audio units are now available to you. Mm -hmm. So those are much more widely used. Uh, the Pro Tools virtual instruments that are included are pretty good. Yeah. Um, I haven't heard people talk about them all that much recently, but they were, they were a big deal uh, when Pro Tools 8 came out. I used them a lot. Used, I, I, I definitely got my money's worth just out of the VIs on that thing. Yeah. But um, I, I mostly use Contact, um, the Steven Slate stuff, but you're looking for like keyboards and stuff. There's Addictive Keys, but and there's there's probably 25 different contact instruments, like really detailed pianos. Mm -hmm. Contact is the standard for samplers. Well, I guess in the home recording show, we just uh, had all of those different organ sounds shot out. So yeah. I'll have to go back and play, pay close attention to the segment we just did <laughs> and, it, and find find one I really like because I'm, I'm going to have to get one now. It was uh, the one that I liked the most from that, which was not going to mean anything to the people that haven't heard that show because at this point no one's heard that episode just but us it was the uh it was the native instruments uh, i think it was the virtual uh no vintage collection or something vintage organs uh, i thought that one and that sounds like that best. would be something that i would be into anyway yeah you asked me earlier about the clip gain that's not even something you had in version nine was nope. it something but, i would have really liked yeah um, but there's so many different ways of doing it in Pro Tools. I mean, in Reaper. <laughs> <laughs> in not Pro Tools. In not Pro Tools. Uh, in so, not this program. Yeah, that ugly thing. Uh, so the default is is the top edge of an item. You just click and drag it down, and that's your volume handle. When you told me that, I couldn't believe it. That's, that's just awesome. Yeah. And anytime you make an edit, uh, if you just that's split the item. On this one. Uh, you, you can just uh, then you can have individual volume control for each uh, section of that item. Wherever there's an edit, you can have a new volume. Well, since level. you mentioned making an edit, I haven't made one in Reaper yet. So, how do I go I, about doing that? I think the that? default is is the S key to make a split. So just click click somewhere on the timeline here. Yeah, whatever so the selected item is. Yeah, and you okay. snap to grid. So press so S. We'll, we'll click there. Pressing S. And did that just kill everything before it? No, it's just deselected it. Ah. It's still there. So it doesn't, it, it's... So it makes a split and selects the, the item on the right side. Okay. So... But you can set this up to be however you want. Any key command, any workflow you're used to in Pro Tools, you can assign it. Sometimes it's a matter of knowing what the... Um, the names for things are because mm -hmm. it's a little bit different and it's actually a lot more specific 
So how do I if, say I want to trim the back half of this? Is it the same deal? You could split it and then you probably the fastest way is to press X and then press command X because that second item is like just cut, uh, cut it to the clipboard. That's what I always do. So let's see. Well, so like I can't just like kind of select it right there and then just say that's where I want my split to be. Um, it's not assigned to the default key commands. But if you open up the action list, I can tell you where, what to look for. See, I find that confusing. So how do I open up this action list? Okay, so uh, question mark key. Hold down shift and then press the question mark key. Where's the question mark? Oh, you mean the, just the question? On, the, on your keyboard. <laughs> <laughs> I can do that. We'll type in uh, item and cursor. Uh, trim... Back, back. You spelled <laughs> spell cursor wrong. It's trim. Okay, so there's trim left edge of item to edit cursor, uh, and then there's trim. Um, and uh, there's move left. Move left edge would uh, uh, move the selected item, like snap the start to wherever you you had the edit cursor. So that's not what you want, but you want trim left and right. So you may as well just press uh, go to add. See down on the, yeah, right there. So left edge, uh, I would press A to be the same as Pro Tools. And then OK. And then for the right edge, in Pro Tools, it's S. Uh, I use, well, I, it's, it's totally up to you. What do you think is the most intuitive way of doing well it? Normally, let's see, let's even just go to Pro Tools. I would just kind of grab a section and then either delete it or mm -hmm. or uh, split, just split anywhere. It's, mm -hmm. I, it wasn't right or left dependent. I think that's the part that's messing me up. Hmm. Okay. So Switch. I could just go like that and hit delete, and that whole section would be gone. Okay, so that's, yeah, so it's it's slightly different in in Reaper. Uh, just because of the way that selections are made and things like that. Can't remember the quite the correct terminology to explain it. But so if you wanted to trim so, the right edge. What would the command be? In, in Pro uh, Tools, it would be S. S. Okay. But S is split. And I find split is probably what you're going to be using more. So if you wanted to do that, you could use D. So what, what does split do then? Is it just put a line? Just... It, it's, it separates the item and Separate. selects the right half of the those two items. Yeah, so that should have worked on the other side of that, though, then, right? Uh, S is the same as if you pressed B in okay. Pro Tools. So it just didn't seem to be working on the back half of that. Like, I just wanted it to split. Mm. Cancel for now. So if I were to go... Do I have to hit anything here to... You can keep that open, or you can close it. Okay. So, but you can you can test out the actions here if you select something and then hit run. So I should be able just to just click right here and hit mm -hmm. S, and then it should cut it, right? Yeah. Oh, and it did. So it splits it, not cut. Cuts. It different. splits it. Okay. So yeah, it splits it into different regions. Yeah. And then if I want to take that region and just delete it, then I can just do that. You can press the delete key, or okay. you can press. Uh, you can set your undo, cut, copy, and paste um, to not need a modifier key. And how I edit is I'll, I'll have a action for trimming the left edge, but I'll keep S the way it is like for sp uh, fade, splitting. Oh, that's and then I'll press just press X to cut anything that's highlighted. And then I don't have to move my hand all the way to the other side of the keyboard. So just put little fades on there? Yep. Yeah, so enough. it's like the smart tool is active mm -hmm. all the time. Okay. Uh, there's not really separate tools to choose from. Uh, there's ways of kind of um, basically, ar you're basically arming an action. So every time you left click, you're tr uh, triggering an action. An action being like, like a split. So if you had a button on the toolbar that is just for split items, if you right click that, it arms it, and every time you left click, it's basically like the scissor tool in other DOS. Okay, and then I could also just grab stuff and just 
pull it back like that if there's nothing playing, right? Yep, of course. And yeah. you could... But um, then if I made a selection, say like I made a selection between these two to kill that dead space... Oops, moving the whole thing now. Yeah, so to make selections, you're, you right-click and drag. Okay. That, that's kind of the main difference. Um, so I'm... Ooh. But I'm, I'm not, right, uh, right now... My right-clicking got... skills are not too good there. Uh, right, right now there is... Uh, a preference that you need to change so that your selections link to uh, your item. Gotcha. Where's that at? No idea. It's messed me up before. <laughs> <laughs> so you have yours set to do that. So you can just lasso something and it'll just grab that chunk, right? But you can make time selections by clicking and dragging on an empty area of a track mm -hmm. or in the ruler. Uh, so your actions apply to uh, whatever the selected items are and usually within the time selection but or optionally within the time selection as well. That's why there's so many actions because they could be um, with the selected item or with the item that is under the mouse cursor or whatever is within the time selection. And there's all these variables and you can choose the best action for each situation rather than kind of choosing for you. Mm -hmm. So I, I like, I like how customizable yeah. it is. It's pretty amazing. Um, it's just, when you just dig into it and you want to do some basic things, it's, it's a little much. The defaults are just not good. I don't mind saying that because I'm you know, actively trying to help people with sorting it out. When I brought everything in, uh, I, I imported it, imported the MIDI, and messed myself up on the beats per minute. So it, it when I changed it after I put the tracks in, it changed all of the audio. It, it pulled all of it. And it, it slowed it all down, but it sounded really good. Like I'm like, this song used to be faster. <laughs> so I started all over again, did the beats per minute first, then imported everything. And then the MIDI sat in perfectly with everything. And then doing the plugins, starting to mix, that all felt pretty intuitive. Yeah. And started clicking through the menus. When it came time to start editing things, then I was like, uh oh, wait a minute. Yeah. That's that's where it gets really daunting. If you're used to like muscle memory for your left hand with the editing shortcuts, then it's yep. it's a pain. But if you are used to just using the mouse, the only thing you have to get used to is not having to switch tools because you can just click in the right area, like click in the top left or right uh, corners and you can make your fade in and out. Uh, you can click on the edges to trim. Yeah, so. I've been editing in Pro Tools for 10 years, so it, it's it's definitely messing with my brains a little bit. And that's one of the things that takes the most time to uh, to sort out. Something that uh, I think is worth checking out is the, uh, the way that it scrolls up and down, left and right, and zooms in and out. Mm -hmm. uh, did you change any of that? No, but I, I realized if I put my mouse right there, it'll then scroll up and down, mm -hmm. which is kind of nice. I put my mouse there, it'll zoom in and out. Uh, how about scrolling left and right? Is there a shift key or something for that? The defaults, I have no idea. To be honest, <laughs> I hate the way that it scrolls and zooms by default. If you go to the action list uh -huh. and go to the filter, yeah, you found it. You can type in scroll uh, and mouse wheel. So these are the actions that you can change that will respond to the mouse wheel. So not all mm -hmm. actions can be assigned to the mouse wheel, but these ones can. I think so the option mouse wheel is scroll horizontally. Okay. Yeah. The way that I like to do it is if I pull the mouse wheel down or towards myself, the tracks should go down. So I'm seeing tracks of the higher numbers. That's the default, mm -hmm. no modifier. Left and right is withholding shift. Or actually, uh, no, I don't use a modifier. I use the horizontal wheel. So I, I use the magic mouse, which it it can scroll in any Look direction. Look at you, yeah. Mr. Fancy Pants. <laughs> the default one that comes with a Mac, it can scroll in any direction. So I go to the, I think it's probably scroll horizontally, uh, the top action there. I click on add and then I move my finger across the mouse to the right or the left. And that assigns it to, to move back and forth. 
it's either that one or, cool. or horizontal reversed and it's just a you know it takes two seconds and then to use try a, it. An, an operator to uh then zoom yeah yeah so i i kind of follow what every other program uses and that's option mouse wheel to zoom in and out those two things or three things um you know you're using it so much i think not having to think twice about how like what direction things are going to scroll and and oh i have to hold down shift to actually uh go up and down or left and right that sort of thing it's your main interaction with the program so you need to get that to be as intuitive as possible yep. Oh, that makes all the tricks smaller. That's kind of cool. That's a vertical, vertical zoom. Yep. And oh, that was the the track, the actual track height. Yeah. Those two things are kind of linked. So basically, you're you're increasing the item height, but you're also increasing the track size, and that can be for an individual track or all tracks at once. And there's also like you can assign a button to maximize a single track height or minimize all other track heights, things like that. So one of the other things is track playlists in Pro Tools. I really like that, mm -hmm. where you have one track, you, you could do a playlist and record another take and do another playlist, record another take, and then have that open up and you see all of them down below and then you can promote them to the, the top track. Uh, is there something like that in here? Not exactly. You can do all the same things in a different way. If you just record over something, it will split the item and then you'll have two layers. You'll basically have playlists for each item rather than uh, linked to a track. Uh, the downside of, of that is like, you can have alternate playlists in, in Pro Tools that are blank. You can have just a blank playlist. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and it, with this, you, you can't, you just use another track. There are unlimited tracks. Uh, there's also track folders, so you could have, let's say, like 10 tapes of vocals on separate tracks with one folder, and just whatever is unmuted is coming through the, the folder. Mm -hmm. But Okay, so use folders basically as playlists. You could, but folders are also organizational and routing. Once everything's in a folder, you could collapse it and basically hide those tracks. But every, all the audio on the individual tracks in the, or they call them child tracks in the folder. Um, yeah, they'll go through that one master fader. Yeah. And just like you'd want playlists, you have certain settings on your vocal, the compressor, the EQ. So everything in that folder would come through that track. So yeah. if you're auditioning your playlists, it's probably the way to go. Well, to to uh, make an analogy to Pro Tools, it would, Please do. it would be like, like often you would have a auxiliary track for all of your drums to go through. Mm. So you've got eight tracks of drums and you have a ninth track that is all of your drums on one fader. You can mute that track and all your drums get muted. Mm -hmm. uh, folders do that. Okay. And I, I realized that instead of having an aux track or an instrument track, they're just tracks. Just tracks. Audio and MIDI. Video if you need. Yeah, so I, I, I labeled all the ones that I, I basically used as buses green. Mm-hmm because that's how they kind of usually came up with Pro Tools, <laughs> so I'd know where they are. Um, and for the longest time, I had to stop looking at the numbers down here, looking for the name of the track. Yeah. That was messing me up pretty good. It is a different DAW, but it seems like you're getting on with it pretty well. The only thing that's going to slow me down at all is editing. Uh, I feel like I'm already mixing just as fast as I would be in Pro Tools. And it should be a lot more efficient if you're using all 64-bit plugins. It should be more efficient. <laughs> <laughs> well, now I know I need to do that. I wrote that down right here. Okay. Um, how does how does Reaper handle latency? Like uh, Pro Tools had uh, whatever that was called that would uh, uh, the delay compensation. That? Yeah, plug that's delay the compensation. One. And yeah. in version nine, they added it for the native systems. Yeah. Um, yeah, it works. Like without having to think about it, just yeah, does it. Yeah, all the tracks and it it all lines up and. If you open up an effects chain, so if you grab any of those, like, like you see the green button on a track that says effects. Mm -hmm. So that's your, that will open up the effects chain. Okay. And at the bottom where there's add and remove. Mm -hmm. So for that selected uh, 
effect, there is 0.2% uh, percent CPU with a total mm -hmm. of 4.2 or 3.8 or whatever. Uh, that's, that's the total amount of CPU used for this track. Yep. And then um, the numbers beside that are the delay. So right now it's zero for that track. Okay. But you could, you know, that could be a huge number depending on the type of effect you're using. But then it compensates for that? Yeah. So um, a track that is record and monitor enabled and it has a lot, a lot of um, delay causing plugins on it, um, that would not be latency we'll see, compensated. Slate. Slate's usually a little bit more of a hog. Well, it's not even, uh, it's nope. all zeros. Yeah. Samplers are usually low latency. So uh, L1 stereo on your master, mm -hmm. that would be something that has a bit of a latency on it. So uh, oh, there we go. I see numbers 64 now. 64 out of 512. Well, on the master, who cares? I mean, it does make a difference if you're doing an overdub and and everything's coming out late or something. If you're, it is a bit of a concern. I mean, it's pro mm -hmm. it's going to delay everything equally, but uh, your vocal will come out late, sort of thing. Like if you're if you're doing a live vocal with effects, yeah, it will still be affected by the latency on the master. Everything down the chain. Okay, so it's all compensated for. Yeah. Uh, I like that. You don't have to worry about it at all. You can manually disable delay compensation, but there's not really any point in doing that. Mm -hmm. Unless the plugin's broken, but just don't use that plugin. <laughs> <laughs> and then what about like audio suite style plugins where in Pro Tools you can take a chunk of your audio and apply effects just to that? Uh, yeah, well, you can just click and drag any effect onto an item. So uh, right now you're not, uh, you don't have the option enabled to show your effects chain when it's empty. So if you open up the preferences, and I think it's the media items thing. Remember, I told I told you about that uh, that thing. So see, uh, media item buttons go to no effects. Mm. Effects is checked, and then below, right below that is no effects. Um, oh, effects right there, no effects. Yes. So it will show a little icon when there is an effect and when there isn't an effect. So you can click on that button. Do you see it in your media items, the little effects? Yep. Yeah. Little effects button. That'll open up your effects chain and your uh, effects browser. And cool. And you can have as many. Um, effects as you want in there and it's all in real time uh, so if you're using something that like has a long tail you might run into an issue where the item ends before the tail of the uh, of your effect mm -hmm. um, where, where there's just not enough sound left for the tail to go on there's yep. there's preferences to tweak that so that it will extend its buffer to be longer so gotcha. I, I think I set it to like uh, 2000, so it's two seconds after the item ends, mm -hmm. the effects will continue for. Where's that setting at? This is under media. And there's a thing called tail length when using apply effects to items. And uh, I have that to 1000 and take effects tail length is 2000. Is that under... Peaks um, and waveforms. Somehow. No, just I have the media one up on mine. You see that? Uh, that's appearance media. <laughs> Scroll down. Boom! This is riveting television. All right, so <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're gonna have to edit the shit out of this. All right, so uh, yeah, so you have so the same set tail length to a thousand. Yeah, so I'm wondering if I should actually change that, but that's fine. It, I've never run into an issue with it, really, unless it was like Valhalla Shimmer, where it's it extends for yeah, it goes on forever. Yeah, there's different ways of rendering the the item that would just be uh, a little bit better for that. Yeah, so now that effect is on the item, 
uh, before the effects chain on the track. Gotcha. That's cool. So you don't really have to commit to it. You can do it in real time still. Yeah. There is kind of a, uh, a RAM load on using this a lot. A I, RAM load. I'll sometimes use like RX4 uh, declicker. Let's say on uh, on overheads where the, the ride symbol just like is really spiky or something mm-hmm. where it's like a clear click. Um, I might use that on the item just on the little bits where it's needed. And then it's the system kind of starts working more in chunks than smoothly. So try to avoid that, but it is a good way of, of working, especially if rather than using automation all the time for like little things that you just need it on for a second. Mm -hmm. Um, You can also use it as a transitional thing. So like if you have a loop in the first half, you want filtered in the second half, you want clean and you want it to fade in. You could split the item, put in a long crossfade of like two seconds, and then um, drop in your effect on the first half with like a high pass filter or low pass filter. And uh, it would automatically crossfade and and everything would still line up and be phase accurate and everything. Cool. Um, you mentioned automation. That was my next question. Uh, how? Yeah, so it's called um, envelopes. Problem solved. <laughs> oh, your sound cut out, so I was I just had to check if you were still there. Oh, let's check to see if uh, Pro Tools is still recording. <laughs> okay. What do you want to control with automation? Track let's say um, I, I would do, yeah, like volume. I saw one of your videos, you had a pencil tool and you were drawing things in. But look, looked a little advanced. What if I want to just click a few dots and kind of, you know, this up, this down. Let's say I was editing um, dialogue and I just wanted to have uh, this first little part up a little bit, this second little part down a little bit. You know, there's there's so many options. If you let's just say, want, um, if you want, just it, want to move the fader, yeah. automate the fader. Yeah. Okay. Let's do so, that. Uh, take your tambourine track there, mm-hmm. and. Below the record arm button is the fader, and then below that on the left is says trim. There's a little icon there you can click on, and that'll show all the available uh, uh, parameters you can automate. So, so volume? Yep. Yeah, so you click that, and it'll bring up a lane for the track Ooh, volume. I like that. You know, I think by default that shows and hides with the V key. If you select a track and then press V, I think it shows and hides. Yep. And I think is P correct. is for panning. Oh, looks like an open a, a P right behind it. Yeah. Okay. So now how do I put little <clears throat> dots on there? Make it do what it do. Go ahead and make a time selection. Uh, so go, grab one of them like that. And then on the the knob or the the little fader on the left side, you can click and drag that up and down, and that'll put in, you know, a straight okay. line thing. Uh, and this is you're in trim mode, so it's. And what if I were to just grab it? It would just do the same thing. Huh? Yeah, once the line the envelope oh, points the, are there, oh, okay. it will do that. So if I grab, say that chunk right there, I'd have to do that first before I can then grab it. Yeah, I think just because the defaults are a little bit weird. Let's see Try it without. Happens. Yep. Won't grab that section. Yeah. Because it, uh, it is something that messed me up before. <laughs> Definitely. Um, but I think a, uh, a command click draws in a, a point. Oh, yeah. Okay, so okay. that's... Oh. Yeah. <laughs> so I ran into that, too, and... <laughs> It erases the point from before. Yeah. I don't remember. I've changed my my settings so much. Uh, but what you're looking for in the uh, uh, in the preferences is called mouse modifiers. So anything that the mouse does is in the preferences, and everything that the keyboard does is in action list. So there's a... What am I looking for? Envelope 
lane. There's envelope lane, envelope point, and envelope segment. So the mouse modifiers are where? In preferences, preferences. under editing behavior. Preferences. And mouse modifiers. And then I want to go to what? So, so there's, search for it. All right. So you've got envelopes. Lanes. No, you've got envelope segment there already selected because that was the last thing you touched. Oh, okay. Uh, see at the top, context, mm -hmm. envelope segment. Mm -hmm. For a left drag, uh, so default action is to move envelope points, ignoring time selection. It's showing here if you press shift, it will insert at a point and drag to move. Command will freehand draw an envelope. Okay, so... So try just holding dropping points. Try holding command and just click and drag. Oh, then you can draw. Yeah. That's cool. Like that. Yeah. Um, the thing I run into with that is that all these points are they're filled in green. Mm -hmm. They are still selected. So if you click and drag, mm -hmm. that will Drags move that whole, whole thing. Whole thing. Um, Which is kind of cool. How do I? Oh, if you uh, if you do the command and get it hit it, it'll deselect that one. Okay, and then you got all of them. Yeah, so it, it's it's a little bit weird because it's like there's too many options. Yeah, then how do you select a range of them? I haven't found the perfect. You have to like setup select for... each each one. I'm trying to select a range of them. Maybe if I just do that, okay. Yeah. You should be able to right click I'm and drag to to. To uh, over the envelope points. Oh, there we them. go. Right click and lasso, and then yeah. there we go. That selects all of them. That's 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 actually really useful. Yeah. Okay. That's that's already better than Pro Tools, and I haven't changed any settings yet. Oh, go ahead and move that item left and right. Not the not the points, but the item above. Oh, this one. Yeah. Move that. Oh, and the whole thing moves with it. Yes. Like so that. So there is an option in the main toolbar which mm -hmm. is below the transport, top left, beside the grid button, the grid lines button. Yeah, the one on the left of that, that disables that function. Okay, cool. I would never want to disable that. I like that. Okay. Because in but, Pro Tools, you move the audio, the, the it stays where it was unless you select both of yeah. them together. There, there's times when you want to copy something, but yeah. you don't want the automation. Or if you move it to another track, all that automation will come with it to another track, and sometimes you don't always want that. And then say I want to delete all these points. Can I just select them like that and hit delete, or will that delete my audio too? I would probably double click on the envelope lane. So uh, below the track, yeah, double click there. Mm -hmm. And that selected them, and then you can hit delete. Uh, or not. <laughs> did it unselect? Delete points and time selection. I right clicked it. There we go. So it was okay. a right click and delete. Yeah, we figured it okay. out. All the options are there. It's it's just a matter of linking them to your brain. And it's not that hard. It's, you know, it's once, really not once that Once I hard. just know that that the stuff exists and where to find it the first time, I'm like, okay, I've done it before. So now I know at least I can do it. Yeah. So that, that one will work for, obviously, volume automation, panning, um, about the 8 million things that were there. So you click on that trim. and Yeah, the more, you, plugins, you do... the more plugins that you add the bigger that list goes but you can limit that list to just the last touched effect parameter mm -hmm. if you see right above the au plugin alliance thing it'll just show the last thing you touched in that uh, plugin so uh, you're in trim okay. read mode so it will uh, apply this envelope to whatever the current value is so add or subtract to whatever the current uh, volume is on that track mm -hmm. uh, as well as read what's there so if you click on that there's different automation modes so i know read touch latch and write so wh what's the trim uh trim is uh no moving faders but okay. it add or subtracts to whatever the current value is okay so the, you, you won't see the fader freaking out for the automation no it's a little hard to describe Especially if you're used to Pro Tools. Um, well, I think I think I understand. Let me let me give it a shot before okay. you go for it. So, in Pro Tools, you pretty much 
can only click read and then your fader will go nuts back and forth but then if you need to make a fine-tune adjustment then you have to use a trim plugin on top just to bring it up or down a little bit yeah. if you go trim and read then the fader stays where it's at it makes all the adjustments and then you could still adjust the fader to give it a little more or less yeah so so like trim uh automation in in pro tools is a is a little different like it would takes whatever is there and then you can add or subtract from what's there but the fader will still move it will still read this whatever you've written for automation and applies and that can be trimmed by the original set by the fader yeah so yeah. uh so this is at minus 4.79 db but the actual track fader is at zero so you could put this um the track fader at plus two and now um your your volume envelope is at minus 2.79 so your main controls override what's on the uh, automation lane is that confusing yeah it is so. it is but you can do most of your automation just in uh trim read mode I usually get like a good rough mix, good static levels for everything, and then I'll use trim read mode to do fine tuning things. So I just made a couple automation um, actions here. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna hit play on it, and so it'll get a little louder, a little quieter, but my fader is not moving at all. Right, but the meter will move. So I should drop off here. Okay, yeah, I got quiet, but then if I wanna bring up the overall, It'll just give me a little bit more volume with the automation I've written. Yes. But it doesn't move any of the stuff there. Yes. That's cool. I, I like that. That's actually yeah, it, a it's kind fantastic of, feature. It's it's kind of a different way of thinking of it. I like thinking that way of it because it makes sense. <laughs> yeah, it, it's so annoying to be like in read mode and then you go and make, oh, I just need this like half a dB different and like, oh, I got to open up the lane and draw it in. Well, see, I wouldn't do that in, in Pro Tools. I would just take the trim plugin, pop it at the top, and just give it like a, a half a dB uh, boost just to boost the overall automation. And that was what you had to do. Yeah. Last big question I had was um, for surround mixes. Can you do that? Yeah, I've never done it. So you uh, basically would just set up multiple outs? Yeah, you, you set your master fader or your master track to have... Um, if you click the I.O. button, it says track channels, uh, you'd set that to six channels. Okay, so... I'm, I'm just uh, reorganizing here so sure. I can have some sanity. Okay. Okay, if you look at your master mm -hmm. track, there's the I.O. button Yep. top of it. Click that. And track channels two, that means it's a stereo track. And you can set that up to 64 and that would that would be a very extensive theater setup. Yeah, but there there are other reasons. Like if you were doing um, sounds for video games, mm -hmm. might want like a single file that has sixty channels or something like that. So it's it's one asset that has multiple channels, and then it, it, uh, it's a whole different world. <laughs> but um, yeah, so then you also need the. Let me check my thing here there's a plugin in the Kako's folder called uh race around would you put that in the master yes i believe this goes on the master as i said it's i've never done a surround mix i'm glad to throw some curveballs at you oh yeah so it's a surround panner that's cool um, and it uh, looks like there's trims there, the bottom right for um, uh, for the overall balance of your outputs and mute solos. Yeah, lots of stuff. Wow. Because uh, I actually have two movies that I mixed in stereo that they want at least a 3.1 mix on both for festivals. So I need to throw all the dialogue down the center and everything else kind of around the sides. Okay. So uh, maybe that'll be my first big uh, movie mix I'll do in Reaper. 
I think to actually route it to those other channels, uh, you'd have to change the I.O. on some of the other tracks. So like you take your vocal folder mm -hmm. or all your dialogue folder and um, set the I.O. to like... Probably be channel uh, three for center. Yeah, something like that. Yep. So just a tremendous amount of routing. There is. You were asking me the other day about um, assigning inputs and stuff like that. You, you, you figured that out yeah. on your own? Yeah, I went into... Uh, where did I go? Uh, probably in preferences, right? Because I, I did I did a little bit of it. Device. Um, so that pulled up that. That's not where I went. Uh, it was something about labeling the names or the... Um, it might just be on the audio thing. Yeah, oh, the edit, edit yep. names. Yeah. Yeah, so that's just your labeling for things. Yeah, so I, I put in all the preamps I have. So that's pretty the, easy uh, to figure out that yeah. part. And so you can got, save, you can export that and stuff. That's the same yeah. as what and I did. IO set up in, in Pro yeah. Tools. And yeah. then, um, yeah, for the outputs, I just put in, you know, monitor, left and right, headphone one and two for sub mixes. Mm -hmm. um, and then I do, I have some external gear I could hook up and all that, label yeah. all that. But that was pretty easy. So, you know, immediately I was able to go in. Um, it, it was shocking how easy the hardware setup part of this was. I turned it on, plugged it in, labeled it, hit record, it worked. Yep. I was expecting it to fight. Uh, and you found like the monitor enable button on the tracks. No. What's that? <laughs> there's, okay. Below the solo, there's a little icon. It's like kind of like a speaker. That guy? Uh, right above that turns green. Oh, that guy. Yeah. So that means that you want to listen to that input. Okay. Yeah, that's like the... Uh, yeah, I was so used to like stuff in Pro Tools, like I didn't think about what it was or where it was. That was uh, option K to turn that on and off, to toggle that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. In Pro Tools, it's linked, unless you're on HD and then it's a separate button. Yeah. The I okay. button. So that's good. And there's different recording modes for each track. You can okay. record the output of a track if you wanted, you know, mm -hmm. like After Effects. There's also, um, you can change the format of the of that particular track. So you could record one track in FLAC. I like wanted. that there's a phase button on here too. That's that's just handy. It's great. It saves so much time. Yeah, because you have to put in a plug-in, even though you're not using it, just to flip the phase. Just to check. And what's this little little A that's up now? Record monitoring that's, auto. I believe that switches it automatically. So if Based you're on if um, playback or recording, if there's something on the track already, it will uh, mm -hmm. mute it. Mm -hmm. Something like that. Yeah, something like that. And there's different recording modes. So there's, so there's like a rec normal recording mode. There's a auto punch selected items. So if you have an item selected. You start playback a little bit early and you hit record, it will record during the length of that selected item, or there's a time selection one. And you get to these different modes by right clicking the recording button on the top left. Uh, not the individual tracks in the transport. Ah, where's my transport? I don't have it up. Oh, over here. Yeah. So I want to right click what? The recording button? Yeah. Yeah, right click that. Okay. Time selection auto punch is usually what I do. If I'm overdubbing stuff mm -hmm. and auto punch selected items, I very rarely do, but it's like, okay, we just want to replace this word. Uh, you would just select the item, hit record. Uh, and it'll punch you in and out. Yeah. And it does record in the background. That's cool. And I found the uh, the whole loop and the, you just hit R, it comes on, right? I don't yep. know why it says command R. Or what's, what's it say command R for? Command R is record. Okay. That makes so sense. you'll you'll probably want to set that to be like command space bar. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I think I'm going to reset a lot of these to some of my Pro Tools ones just so my muscle memory doesn't completely blow me up. Yeah. You see that fader at the top where it says rate 1.0? Yeah. Is that your speed for the whole session? Yeah. Play Go ahead rate. and hide that because you're going to accidentally mess over that and mess up a project. <laughs> Don't click on it, but click anywhere outside of it. Yeah. Right click there. And show play rate control down a little bit. Yeah. 
so I'll just hide that. That messes up more projects than anything. Oh, I would else, imagine. I yeah. So what, uh, what's some stuff that maybe I should be looking at? In the options menu, go up to the options menu. Um, trim contents behind media items when editing. You want that on? That auto crossfade media items when editing is an awesome feature. Uh, every time you split, it's it's making fades. Nice. But trim contents behind media items makes it work more like Pro Tools. Okay, so you have one long item and you move a small item into the middle of it. Mm -hmm. With that off, it would make a fade that overlaps the entire item. With that on, it would just insert it into that space. Oh, cool. What's locking? Uh, locking prevents the uh, item from being edited. Okay. Standard issue. Mm -hmm. If you look in the preferences, another crossfades thing. Under project and media item defaults. Uh, am I there? Uh, yes. So the thing at the top is create automatic fade in, fade out for new items. Uh, new items, turn that off. Overlap across fade items when splitting. Length, uh, I do zero. I can't see yours. Zero. Uh, change that. So that says 10. Uh, 10 milliseconds, change that to 5 milliseconds. That's 50. Yeah, it is. <laughs> and fade shape, that's probably... So that's that's where you can set your default fade shapes mm -hmm. as well. I um, usually did and, more of a straight line kind of deal, but... Linear? Yeah. That's, that's probably the top fine. one. Yeah. And... Uncheck those three things at the bottom. Yeah. So th so that's basically like if you extend an item past its edge mm -hmm. on something you import, it will automatically repeat the contents of the item. Ah, yeah, we so, don't want that. Yeah, it's a little unintuitive. Uh, I think those are the basics and how long have we been recording? An hour and nine minutes, so. Uh, <laughs> a video that nobody's going to watch. Tons of people that ask about basic setup and stuff, so uh, I think people will enjoy it. There's some stuff I'll definitely have to edit out. Is there anything um, that we should cover that's even more basic than what I asked? Not today. <laughs> <laughs> I'll put this out, and, and people that have an hour to watch will enjoy it, maybe. Well, uh, let's wrap it up. Um, Thanks for chatting with me. I hope you, I've solved a lot of these issues for you. Cleared things up more than confused. No, it helped me a lot. I had an entire page of questions and we got through all of them. So uh, thank you so much. This uh, actually does help a lot. And now I don't have to spend $800 on Pro Tools, another $1,500 on a new computer, and then another $2,500 on a new interface. Yeah. And now you can enjoy more plugins. Spend some of that money on new plugins. And well, I'm going like to have to get a lot of VIs. Probably. That's the only thing that's hurting me. And then upgrade all of my plugins to 64-bit. After that, I'm good to go. <laughs> Sweet. Thank you so much. Yep. Talk to you later. Bye-bye. Check out the home recording show. <laughs>